you very much for that overview and, and for the warm welcome. Uh, the course that, uh, that I direct, Managing for Integrity, through various incarnations, has, has been held for five summers at the summer school. And, um, and we've been delighted and experienced all the characteristics that you've said. One of the greatest pleasures of the students is, uh, is well beyond the faculty, is exactly the exposure to students from other countries whom they would otherwise, in the normal course of professional life, never come across and never meet. And uh, the environment that we're in, the city that we're in, and the university that accommodates us are all extremely stimulating. And thank you very much for that. We uh, wanted to put to you a, uh, a discussion, really one for debate. And we will have about half hour of presentation with, with two very eminent speakers uh, on a topic that is as current as it is sensitive in some respects. Because going back 20 years, almost to these weeks, right, 20 years ago, a few border guards, a few courageous Hungarian border guards, started letting Eastern Europeans out through the border without permits. And little by little, over the next few months, right, the Berlin Wall and the other aspects of the barrier between East and Western Europe started to crumble. So it happened right here, on the border of, of borders of Hungary. Now, what happened in the ensuing years, of course, was an in incredible transformation in so many countries, a wave of democratization and of opening of societies in one country after the other. And there was a lot of uh, very optimistic writing at the time, that, that this transition marked finally a new wave of democratization and, and it hit not only Eastern Europe but also parts of Asia and many parts of Africa and some countries in South America. And this wave of democratization brought with it then economic transformations and social transformations. Democratic practice is now far more widespread, of course, than it ever was in human history. But now, in recent years, there have been some head scratching and maybe some questions asked about where things stand. Is maybe there is there something wanting in the quality of the governance that comes out of it, in the quality of elected politicians? The procedures to deliver elections, those are being mastered and perfected over time. It's not that they aren't being abused. And the recent fiasco in Iran is perhaps a powerful example of that. But there are, of course, limits to what can be done by those crude methods. But even if you do clean up that process, you know what guarantee is there that better politics comes out of it, even if the ballot box is transparent, even if it is electronic, do you have a guarantee of cleaner politics and that the will of people is better represented at the end of it? On the one hand, there is an extreme question that can be asked, which is, why is it that seemingly people are willing to elect politicians whom they know to be corrupt and whom they know to be vile and these people get elected, and they get re-elected. Famous case in Europe is, of course, Berlusconi. Right? People were not bribed. The ballot box was not stuffed. Yes, you know, his activists and people well known to him might have given favors. They might have handed out free mobile phone cards. But that doesn't quite explain why he has gotten re-elected time and time again when everyone knows the extent of the allegations against him. The fact that he's been able to change the law in order to not make it prosecutable only shows the extent, actually, of the abuse of his power. In our class this afternoon, uh, one of the leading Indian investigative journalists showed us the remarkable work that they had done in um, showing the extent of the complicity, but more than complicity, the direct involvement of the government of Gujarat, one of the biggest and most powerful states in India, in a massacre of Muslims that took place in 2002. Some of you might have seen it. 
in 2002, there was an incident, a burning of a train of some Hindu militants where 58, 59 people died. And in the ensuing few days, 2,000 Muslims were killed in an orchestrated pogrom. The government of Gujarat organized this. This was 2002. 2007, this investigative team show the extent of the government's complicity and how top people call the chief minister to get instructions. And they caught it all on tape, on video tape. The elections took place shortly thereafter, and the government was re-elected. You have examples in Israel. You have examples in Japan. You have examples in Thailand. You have examples in far too many places of corrupt and vile politicians being knowingly re-elected. How does that happen? So do we simply get what we deserve? And then the opposite question, of course. How can politicians with more integrity be encouraged? How can politicians with greater integrity make it through the system? Is it possible at all for that to happen? Of course, there's a tremendously inspiring politician, inspiring in his rhetoric, inspiring in his persona, who made it to the top of American politics in a way that very few people could possibly have imagined even a couple of years ago. So perhaps there is an exception there. But perhaps, you know, what, what do we draw from that? And what do we draw from that? That is a very expensive democracy to run, a very dirty political system in many respects. Do we have any glimmers of hope for the ways in which politicians with greater integrity can be encouraged? when the cost of entering into politics just seems to be rising. One of the shocking figures, and it's by no means an official one, the American elections were the most expensive elections held in history, right? the campaign for the American presidential elections of 2008. I thought, well, you know, nothing can top that. But apparently the April elections in India, the national elections in India, they spent even more on the Indian political campaign than in the American one. Now that money is going to come from somewhere and it's going to come back from somewhere. So one big part of the question of open societies, the freedom of the media, at least when it's not owned by a few a handful of people, as in Italy, for example, and the holding of elections, we know how to run proper electoral processes. But what is it that we get at the end of the day? And that seems to me to be one of the very, very big questions for the coming decades. Because unless that one is addressed, and unless there is integrity in the political outcome and the quality of politicians, and if money politics and power politics and muscle politics are the ones that can trump those systems and procedures, then the promise of open societies is, is going to be pushed back, is far too easily pushed back. So that's the question for debate for discussion this evening. And we have two very eminent speakers whom we have the pleasure of, of having with us this evening. First, to my immediate left, is Nuhu Rebadu, who was executive chairman of the first and most powerful anti-corruption agency in Nigeria and actually in Africa, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. In a small, in a very few years, from 2002 to 2007, he was able to make changes happen in Nigeria that were quite baffling. He took on just about every state governor. He took on the highest of the high. And actually, if it could be done in Nigeria, it can be done anywhere. But Nuhu Rebadu will tell you what has happened subsequently. <laughs> T.S. Krishnamurti, was Chief Election Commissioner of the world's biggest democracy, of India. A democracy where more than 700 million people voted in the last elections, right? Or not voted, but are, are eligible to vote. But 700 million eligible voters, quite extraordinary, right? So in, in a country where, where I was born, Norway, right? 4.7 million people. It represents just a little war. Right? The, the magnitude, the, the 
conception of what it means to just administer and run those elections is absolutely staggering. Unfortunately, the quality of the politicians covers a very wide spectrum. Some of them have quite serious cases pending against them. Some of them are elected out of jail. And some of them are truly quite remarkable. But how do we get that spectrum and how do we maybe possibly clean up on a bit of that? So I'll ask T.S. Krishnamurti, representing one of the oldest democracies from the developing transition world, a democracy where in the developing transition world, in the post-colonial era, post-World War II, there are only a very small handful of countries that remained democratic throughout that time. India had a couple of years of emergency, right? But otherwise has remained and strengthened its democratic practices for all those years. Nigeria doesn't quite have that track record. But being the biggest country in Africa, the most powerful country in Africa in so many respects, of course South Africa is the richest by far, but it's the biggest country in Africa by population. It's so terribly important to think of what it might mean to get Nigeria right. Here's Krishna Murthy. Could I please invite you up here? Thank you, Fred, for the introduction. Let me first compliment uh, the Central European University and the uh, Chile, in whose who support this course is being organized. I must compliment both of them because it's one of the finest courses I have come across and I do hope that this will be replicated if possible in every continent. I would also like to compliment the Central European University for bringing so many nationals together under one forum for various training courses and I do hope that this will promote goodwill and understanding between peoples and countries. Well, today I'm supposed to talk about the integrity in politics, whether it is an oxymoron or it's a real possibility. Some decades back, the British Prime Minister, Lord Acton, mentioned power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Is this true? Well, if you look at the pages of history of the world, you will come across the absolute truth in the statement. Even the most honest politician, when he gets power, when he holds positions of power, is so much tempted to be corrupt. It is partly his personal character and partly the compulsions of office which leads every ruler, almost every ruler, to become corrupt. Democracy and development were considered as remedies to authoritarianism. In the last few decades, you found many countries almost embracing democracy, thinking that that is the only solution to achieve pub good public governance, to achieve good social and economic growth. Alas, in spite of 120 countries having taken democratic shape, you will hardly find a few of them to be really a democracy in substance. Many of them are only democracy in form. So many revolutions have taken place in the history of the world to achieve good governance. But have we achieved? Certainly not. Very ironically, both these conceptual aspirations of democracy and development seem to have miserably failed, giving, giving an impression that they provide a fertile ground, a hunting fertile ground for corrupt, the dishonest and inefficient politicians and bureaucrats. Swiss bank balances is a clear indication of how money has been stacked, how it has been transferred from some of these poverty-stricken countries by the rulers of these countries. And they are finding it difficult to get it back to their respective country, as though a few countries seem to have succeeded. The few advanced countries have succeeded, not the poor ones. I do hope. In India, there's a big debate going on on getting the funds from the Swiss banks which are locked up in secret bank accounts. I come from a country where you have, as Fred mentioned, 700 million voters, but on the, the most important aspect of it is every conceivable human problem, whether it is economic, social, or political, exists in that country. 
We have embarked upon a great experiment of democracy and development. I can't say that we have. We can be very proud of our record, but we can certainly say that we have held periodical elections according to the constitution and there has always been smooth transition of power in spite of some occasional grievances. The only aberration we had was in 1975 when one of our prime ministers having been disqualified by the, by the court for irregular electoral practices imposed what is known as emergency. But the people within two years when the election took place they gave a fitting lesson to her and to her party for playing with the liberty of the people. Hatred towards politicians seem to be the pattern all over in the world. Why hatred and indifference? Corruption seems to be so universal. It is not that only the poor countries are corrupt. The richer countries are equally corrupt, but maybe not at the, the extent of the corruption is same. The recent example in Britain where parliamentarians, in spite of their education and economic development, seem to have indulged in questionable practices to claim expenses which are certainly not to be from the taxpayers' money. Most of the countries which obtain freedom from imperial rule is beginning to realize that democracy has its own limitations. Corruption seems to be very common. Very poor governance and corruption by, by politicians and bureaucrats seem to be the cause of this hatred. True, some are relatively better, while others are probably in the queue. Corruption is at political or bureaucratic level. It is at policy uh, as well as policy formulation stage as well as implementation stage. Integrity issues in developing countries differ slightly from developing countries. Although, even rich and advanced countries are not free from this malice. Strangely, corruption, like the quality of mercy, benefits the giver and the taker, and hence very attractive at the cost of public interest and public money. Is honest and transparent politician difficult to find? Is what has been stated in the discussion of this today's subject, namely whether it is an oxymoron, honest politician? Certainly not. I do not share that view. But then, if you really look at the, the political systems of the various countries, you feel it seems to be real. In, a, in the world where we have had Lincoln, Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, Julius Narare, and at present our own Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. We have reasons to believe that honest people can survive in this rather complicated and corrupt world. Why don't we find more of these such characters? Why do we find only more corrupt rulers? What is the reason for corruption to exist? What is the reason for politicians taking to corruption like duck to water? It's because the opportunity exists, plenty of opportunity, power and funds at easy disposal. People are more indifferent to public issues of governance. Thirdly, poverty, illiteracy, especially among women, ignorance of procedures, they seem to contribute to the success of corrupt political rules. The politicians find it is profitable it is because it is rarely detected. It's because it is, even if it is detected, it is rarely enforced effectively. The regulatory authorities and the judicial institutions do not seem to be keen to enforce the rules and the laws effectively. There may be many reasons for that, but it's a fact. There are institutional and procedural deficiencies in the system which contribute to the success of corruption. Integrity, in my opinion, integrity in politics, is, in my opinion, is not an oxymoron. Certainly it is not. But it seems so because of most of our leaders are not accountable today. They enjoy immunity from punishment. And there are very poor role models to prove that politicians can be honest and effective. 
It may not be too common, but it is indeed a real possibility, provided you have various factors that promote some of them. Anti-corruption movements need to be more vocal, more demanding. We have a case of an individual who tried his best, who probably had to face difficult uh, responses. Difficult is an understatement probably, he went through more uh, difficult times. We have to promote voter awareness, both during the election and post-elections. Very often, most of our voters, they do not exercise the vote, and they have no reason to grumble later. I believe in the, Western, in the European Union elections, hardly 53% voted. In Indian elections, normally, in the last elections, we had 60% voted. But voter awareness by itself does not indicate the success of democracy. You have 80% voter turnout in Iran. It has become controversial. I'm not saying it is a flawed election, but there are questions being raised. So we have not only to turn up at the elections, but we have also to show that we mean the interest of the country at every stage, whether it's the policy formulation or policy implementation. We have to have good redressal procedures. They need to be streamlined. They need to be accessible to public. Very often all these procedures exist in paper. When somebody goes to an office to have his grievance redressed, he's not welcome and he's often turned away with some reason or other. Technology has to be invoked to improve governance. We have had many instances. I mean, as I said, India is a country which probably thrives in chaos. We have certain very pleasant and proud features of good governance. We have resorted in a big way to e-governance in many areas. But then there are many more areas where, which, where we need to extend. We have been able to check corruption in some of these areas, for, like issue of passport, like um, the railway tickets, the air tickets. Now they're all available on tech, uh, by internet. The tickets are delivered at home. You don't have to stand in the queue and corrupt and uh, pay bribe to the counterman. So technology can play a very important role, role, provided the bureaucrats and the politicians take interest in it. Reform of civil service, judicial system and political parties is another, it's another area where most of these countries have to concentrate. Women empowerment, we have found has been as one of the good features which promote good governance, which also checks corruption. We have, particularly, we have two or three states in India where women liter illiteracy is very high. And now, fortunately, at the local self-government level, we have 33 and one third percent representation of women in all political posts. We hope the new government has indicated that they will very soon extend it to 50 percent. Recognition and reward of the honest and efficient public servants is a factor which has to exist if you want to eliminate corruption among politicians. We cannot have cases of a friend that people be not allowed to function freely. In fact, we should find a scheme, a system by which we can reward such honest individuals. We should be able to not only reward monetarily, but to recognize because they will become good role models for the youth to follow. In fact, in our country, the population, 70% of the voting population is below the age of 40. And we sincerely hope, with more and more importance, if given to the youth, corruption to a large extent can be arrested. Decentralization of power is another area where politicians have, can be can be uh, controlled or regulated. At the moment, in most of the developing countries, power is centralized, and the central government seems to have the control over the political power and the financial power. We have, in the last few years, experimented with what we call as the village panchayat raj, where power, to a limited extent, has been given, but there is a reluctance to provide extra power to them, there is a reluctance to provide extra funds to them. We have a case where in one village in, in South India, where the village 
on its own has generated surplus funds by efficient use of wind power and they are able to generate extra wind power, surplus wind power, gener electricity to the state government for a price. So it is not that it is not possible. Periodical disclosures of finance assets by political parties, party leaders is yet another reform that can improve the quality of governance. Thanks to a Supreme Court judgment, we have introduced that all candidates contesting for election should declare by an affidavit uh, details relating to their assets and liabilities, their um, uh, dues to the state, their educational qualifications, their criminal record, because this is one feature in India where unfortunately because of judicial delays, criminals are able to contest elections and sometimes win in a handsome manner. So we need to educate the people. They should know what kind of candidates are contesting for the elections. And in the last two elections, this disclosure has helped in a big way to identify. And in particularly in the 2009 elections, many corrupt, many criminal candidates were defeated at the elections. Now let me come to the conclusion. I suppose I have another 10 question minutes. Just three minutes. Three minutes. Okay. <laughs> Integrity can be promoted by two methods. Two methods. There are organizational issues which can promote integrity. There are issues of values which can promote integrity. Integrity cannot be taught easily. It has to be inborn. It has to be imbibed. It has to be implanted <coughs> at all times. I invite your attention to a book called The Politics of Hope by Jonathan Sachs, in which he takes a child along the streets of London. First he shows the Westminster, the parliament, and tells the child that here is all political power that is exercised and it is supposed to be for the good of the people. Then he takes the child through the streets of Oxford Circus and so on and says, this is the place where wealth is created, wealth is distributed, and these people also claim that they are going to help the poor people become richer. But then the child asks the father, why is it people are still rich or poor? Why many people have problems of illiteracy, poverty, malnutrition, and so on? And he takes to the St. Paul's Cathedral and says, this is what can play the role. Values at home, values of religion, values of society need to be encouraged. It is not an easy job. Checking corruption is not an easy job. There is plenty of literature on corruption, on democracy, and so on. And still, we are groping in the dark. But I have no doubts that each country will find to its local culture, find persons to bring about changes so that political honesty becomes the order of the day. I have no doubt that with education, with role models coming in every country, we can hope to see more politicians honest. But it requires a strong will. It requires will from every individual. It is not merely talking in a lecture hall and forgetting about it. There must be a transformation. This is not the time for reform. It is time for transformation. And if we do not, the future generation is not going to pardon us. We have an accountability to ensure that power is made accountable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think my job is done, really. Let me just say I agree with him 100%. I'll, I'll just go and sit down. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me start by giving my own thanks as well. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Frederick, a very good friend, the university, and indeed the honor to have the chance to really stand before you 
I want to just call this a mini United Nations. And <laughs> it's wonderful. It's a rare privilege for anyone to have a chance to talk to an audience like this. Thank you very much for that. Uh, my name is Nuguri Badu, and uh, I'm from Nigeria. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm really, I don't know, after what he said, I've been a professional and he spoke very well about uh, elections and leaders and so on. Me, I've, I fought corruption, and that was my responsibility. That's what I did all my life. Uh, I want to bring a little fable, a little bit of that into the subject, and a little bit of the African context into the subject. My belief is that politics is everything, and politicians determine, really, what countries do, how countries turn out to be, whether they can make it or not. And it is very clear, even now, look at countries that are doing very well, and see the quality of people who are in charge, and see those who are not doing well. It's very simple arithmetic. I've always admired, for example, the Scandinavians. They are probably some of the best in the world today. And see the quality of people who are their own leaders. And compare it with those who are not doing well at the extreme end of the ladder. And in this case, I want to talk about my own Africa, my own people. Today, unfortunately, tragically, we are the lowest of the law. We literally live on the kindness of others. We fail. The world moves so fast and we are left behind. Why? Simply because I think it's a failure of those who manage us. Failure of those who somehow start our own lives. Failure of those who manage us, who are supposed to direct us and give us a chance for us to be able to address our own problems. And that is what we are talking about, the politics and the integrity in the whole process. If you have bad leaders, chances are nothing will work. This is all through history, all throughout history. Look at societies that have made it well and reflect and see those who manage them and see what really happened. How did they get to where they are? You see Europe, the entire Western world, America, and all. see what their history is and how through pro history they are able to really come up with a system that really worked, managed themselves very well, and the rest of the world that tried to copy. Those who did very well in terms of copying did fairly better. Those who did very, very bad are the ones who are at the top of the lowest of the ladder. <laughs> it's a very simple thing. I mean, there is no sophistication in the whole process. You will understand what I'm talking about. And I want to relate, for example, with what is happening in Africa, like I told you. I want to, for example, take a country like Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is a country that was managed by the colonialists and the white people and those who are in charge, who unfairly oppressed the rest of the population and reduced them to a level of somehow, as if they are slaves and servants. But the economy worked well. I visited Zimbabwe in 1984-85. Zimbabwe was probably as good as any country in, Western, in the Western world. I visited Zimbabwe about two, three months ago. Zimbabwe changed, and then it got into the hands of the present leadership, Mugabe, who somehow believed that you know there is no country without him, who somehow brought people like him and turn the country into a personal thing, who threw out completely what we call the integrity, honesty, competence, and everything, and selfishly turned everything into their own self-used, instead of the common use of all. Today is one of the worst countries in the world. It's tragic. It's one of the worst, worst countries in the world. A country that was at one point almost feeding the entire Africa, today relies on others to sell food for them. It's not only Zimbabwe. There are several other countries in Africa that you can give example with. Somebody talked about the former, I mean, the last speaker mentioned some very good quality leaders across the world, and they are very good example 
of what good politicians with integrity can do for their own people. For example, you mentioned the name of Julius Nyerere. Julius Nyerere was the president of Tanzania, first elected president. Tanzania is not different from the rest of African countries that had difficulties and civil wars and conflicts. Tanzania was more or less like nothing, not in terms of much of natural resources and anything. Tanzania had over 200 and something uh, tribes, about 275 or so. But the way Mualimu, Julius Nyerere, managed the country, he ended up having a country that is probably the most unified in the continent today. It's only Tanzania, why you can see. In spite of their own difference in tribes and so on, that every Tanzanian will call himself a Tanzanian before becoming, be calling himself anything. Not far away from Tanzania, I want to compare with Somalia. Somalia had a tragedy of having bad politicians, bad leaders, those with zero integrity and honesty in charge of their own affairs. Today, Somali, one country, with one tribe, with one language, with one religion, have been killing each other and literally destroyed themselves to a point that it is a failed state. I want to just make these two comparisons about two continents, African countries. Take, for example, Congo. Congo is a country that was given as a gift to King Leopold of Belgium about two, three hundred years ago. Private gift to him by Stanley. About 200 years after that, Mobutu decided to also take it as a gift to himself. <laughs> and for 40 years, he plundered that country. He destroyed it. Today, Congo is not different from the Congo two, three hundred years ago. We're talking about leaders and we're talking about politicians and we're talking about people who are in charge of affairs of people. I try to simplify these things to make an example to explain. And why? Simply because, to me, it's the most important thing, it's the most fundamental thing. In Africa today and in so many other countries across the world, politics is like business. Why you do not have systems, why you do not have development, the only thing there is government. Government is the only source through which you can make money. Government is the only source through which you can exercise power and authority. Unfortunately, we are late in everything, and we ended up having to rely only on this one single source, government. So the struggle, the fight, and the desperation to control government is about everything in our own societies. At the end of the day, bad people, crooks, the smart ones among us, will always take the lead. Good people will not have chance. It's very, very rare you find that an honest good person will be able to compete and be able to win power through any process. In a very underdeveloped societies, especially like Africa. And even those who have made it, chances are they will not even survive. I'll give you an example, for example, in Nigeria, where I come from. We had a fairly number of good and bad leaders across. We were lucky through coups, we were able to produce some fairly good leaders with integrity. But they never survived. The first one, for example, General Murtala Mohammed, we call him. He tried to sanitize, he tried to clean up, he tried to introduce integrity and I mean, uh, accountability in governance. They killed him in six months. There was another one called General Buhari, who also took over as a military officer, tried to clean up as well. He was sent to jail and he, after just 18 months, and he remained in prison for three years. But we had others, those who are like the, a reflection of the pleasure of those who somehow take advantage, take money, share it with those, continue to use, perpetuate, allow the whole system to be taken over by corruption, and they are on top of it. We had a Babangida that remained for nine years, almost wiped out the country. We had Abacha, General Abacha, one individual who took six billion dollars from a poor country like Nigeria. But he remained, nothing happened to him until when God killed him. And we have continuous everywhere. 
Today, look at, for example, what is happening in South Africa. South Africa is a very good example. Zuma won free and fair election. A very, very popular person. Why? Ask the question. Frederick asked, and he said, how come do we end up with those like that who are able to make it and not the good and quality ones? It's simple. It's poverty. It's, I mean, it's illiteracy. It's desperation. It's hope. The ordinary poor people of South Africa never imagined that, you know, after so-called independence and after the end of apartheid, their life was going to continue. They thought that, you know, it was going to improve. They didn't realize that you just have to work hard for you to be able to first, you know, you to be able to reap the benefit. Becky tried to do that. Very difficult. It was not perfect. He did not really say he ran the most the cleanest government either. But he tried. He tried to some extent. But he did not go to the ordinary people. Such things do take time. Zuma, a very smart guy, a good politician by African standard, connected very well with the people and tell them, yes, you are cheated. You are entitled to more than that. And they don't care whether Zuma had 20 wives or 30 wives. I don't personally care anyway. My father had four wives. I'm all right. <laughs> <laughs> but what I disagree with is if you rape a woman and do other horrible things. But the tragedy about it is that today people like him do have advantage. And if you are going to continue to run free and fair elections, chances are people like him will continue to win. Tragically, it may be a process through which maybe we will overcome it with education, with development, and a little bit of more sophistication. We may get to a point where we will realize this. But for as of today, what is going on in Africa is that people like them do have an advantage, a massive one. In other parts of the world continent, you don't even have the election at all. They steal elections. The votes of the people do not just count. They sit down and write the results. In the case of Nigeria, that is exactly what happened. The election did not take place. So certainly, I believe the issue about integrity in politics is something that maybe is the most fundamental issue. And it's such a difficult one for us to really solve or sort. And it may not necessarily mean that people will just have to give up. It has to be something that people must confront, must fight, and must see the possibility of addressing it. When I saw what is happening in the UK recently, when parliamentarians have been asked to account for their own expenditures and so on, a lot of Africans are laughing. They say, how you can just bring your politicians? We saw that people are being asked for spending 500 pounds. 600 pounds, 700 pounds. The politicians in Africa are the highest paid in the world. Nobody talk about what they spend. These are not even issues. Government itself is personalized. Everything is taken out. And that is what the, the price for winning an election, for being in control of authority. And I see what is happening in the UK, and it is very good for them. And that's all they have been for 600, 700 years. They have been evolving and re-improving themselves daily. But also in Africa, it is not just a lost hope. Not long ago, out of the 54 countries that are in Africa, or 53, 54, about 46 were under military dictatorship. Today, we have less than three. Not long ago, all of them were under colonial administration rule. Not a single country, country, country in Africa today is under any military, I mean, uh, foreign uh, control. It's a process I think it is really going to take time. What the challenge is probably how do we fast track it? How do we make, we make it in a way where we can shortcut and fast track the process and start catching up with the rest of the world? It is going to depend on our ability to come up with quality, honest leaders who are the politicians with integrity, with accountability, that may be able to take us through this. The challenge is what we, 
Those of us, no one else can do it for us, apart from we ourselves, we the Africans. How are we going to create up? How are we going to start looking at these possibilities? How are we going to make it a reality to fast track the process? Whether we like it or not, ultimately the solution will come. As bad as the African case is, as bad as the Arabs, because Arabs are also extremely bad. Maybe worse than Africa. Because their few leaders are in control of everything. And they, there is nothing about integrity. You dare to call the caution. Go to Mubarak and ask him about integrity. Or King, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia. Or, or Muammar Gaddafi, who thinks that he is a king of kings now. He's not just okay with Libya, he's going to take over Africa as well. Or talk about the gentleman who is the son of Moroccan president, who was, you know, all of them, or Bashir, who will take his power from his father in Syria, or Jordan, who believe that it is, you know, all of them are like that, basically. Nobody talks about even anything about integrity and so on and so on. But I believe it is a matter of time. Chances are, chances are, if we are lucky, with the changes taking place here and there, the world is no more a very little small place that you can do what you want and get away with it. We have seen it happen in Iran. Iran, what has happened in the last few days, is a clear message that you can't continue. You will, call, you will for a while. The mullahs who are today the beneficiaries of this, what is going on there, will also see what happens to Shah of Iran. It may come, it's a matter of time. And I believe that with all the initiatives and effort, good people across the world, and I'm very happy, for example, what happened in the world today with the emergence of Obama as the president of America. How I wish I would have a chance to talk to him and tell him that the change he has brought all that people of America got also deserve to go to some other people who are desperate for it. There are people who are desperate for change. There are people who, because of failure of leadership, because of poor integrity, starving politicians and leaders, there are people that have been reduced to the lowest of the law. They are the poorest in the, in the world. And that they deserve the change. They deserve this change more than even the Americans and the Europeans and so on. What can you do? And you can do it without necessarily having to take a gun and go and say that you are going to change their governments. No. You can do it by simply helping those who are trying to change. You can do it by simply. We, some of the things that we did, for example, in Nigeria, we attempted to change things. At the time when we got the opportunity to start fighting corruption, one of the first things that I decided to do was, first and foremost, what could we do to improve the quality of people who are going to be in charge of us? I brought a lot of people to justice. A country that never had one single conviction at the time when I was removed, I had close to about 300 convictions, including governors, president of the Senate, ministers, and so on. One of the individuals that I brought to justice gave me $15 million cash. Now, but this is a man, the reason why I'm giving an example with him, is a man who got two convictions in the UK before going back to Nigeria and getting himself elected as governor. And as a governor, he stayed and close to about a billion dollars within eight years of the time he was in charge. At the time when we were investigating him, we found him with $750 million. So he left only 250 to the state. He took two thirds of the money. How possible can such a society? And this is why, for example, he is from the Niger Delta. I'm sure you hear about Niger Delta and Niger. It is like an ongoing civil war going, on, going there. One single individual as a governor of a state in the Niger Delta took $750 million himself and his people. And this is the person who installed a government in Nigeria. This is the person who, his own cronies are the state governors of these states. And these are the people who will never allow democracy to take place because they have the money. Because if you have money and people are desperate, who are poor, you will get them to do whatever you like. And that is the vicious cycle we found ourselves. And it is happening not just in, in Nigeria. You, call, you, cry, you cut across, you go to Niger, it's happening the same thing. You go to Cameroon, where the president has been there for 20 to 30 years. The same thing. He has cornered the resources, taken the money of it, continued to perpetuate himself in power, 
and you go to almost everywhere. You go to Kibaki, the same thing. You go to almost all, all the rest of the African countries where you have to, apart from the very few, very few countries. I have seen, for example, people like Mo Ibrahim trying to pay or give price. It's amazing. It's terrible. Give price for being an honest person. You know, people don't think about it. What in 50 something African leaders, he said he's going to give five million dollars to somebody who is honest. Sir, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> you might want to mention that you didn't take the money. Right? The 50 million were offered to you. you didn't take it. <laughs> Can I open it up to the floor and suggest that we take three, four questions at a time? And can you please uh, say, give, say your name and where you're from? Okay, uh, my name is Judea, so I'm from Indonesia. Uh, I have two questions. My first question is to Mr. Ribadu. When we talk about uh, clean country uh, prosperity, we always refer to Scandinavia. When we talk about poverty, we talk about corruption, we always refer to Africa. Yes. I'm afraid that actually good thing and bad thing is like pirates, it's spread out. If that's true, then any effort by its country in Africa will be useless. Because, you know, its country influences its other. I believe that if Switzerland, one of the richest nations in the world at the moment, we can move it and put it in the middle of Africa in 15 years, can be poor. <laughs> so, I'm an optimistic person, but talking about Africa, I'm very pessimistic. Do you see there is a light at the end of the tunnel? Can you tell me a new story to make me optimistic again? <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Chris thank you for the very uh, inspiring speech. Uh, there was a time in which India's economy accounted for more than 50% of world GDP. There was a time. In 1950, India has democracy. But then, now, if we use 1.25 US dollar as a benchmark, 85% population in India live below those benchmarks. Africa even much better because only 80% of the population live below 1.25%. So please tell me how democracy in India can deliver a promise of a prosperous people, prosperous economy. Thank you. Okay. Let us let us take a couple. I mean, this is a very good question. Yeah. Set of questions. But let us take a couple more. So if if there are some more questions, right now. Yes, please. Hi, uh, my name is Siddharth. I'm from India. My question is to Krishnamurti and slightly linked with his second question to it uh, that he addressed to him. Uh, the problem that you've seen in India very well orchestrated after the Mumbai attacks, uh, which the world saw, was that despite the attacks, despite what happened after it, despite the activism, uh, people who tend to get economically affluent don't come out and vote. And how is that going to change? Any other questions before we have the medicine? No? You are right. I mean, it is sad for me to continue to, I mean, all of us, it's not that we like the, the, the comparison, but it's the truth, the honesty, uh, the reality. These Scandinavian countries are, are, you don't need to even, you just live, go and see how people live there. It's not about even being rich. It's about order. It's about doing things properly and correctly. It's about law, uh, rule of law. Hardly you can see violence. You, you, the little money, the resources they have, they share it properly and correctly. And Switzerland, for example, they don't even have one centralized president where, you know, but things work. And uh, for example, take Norway. Norway is an oil producing country, just like Nigeria, like Saudi Arabia. Just like Angola, if you see how Norway is making good use of this oil that they have got, it's unbelievable. It's incredible. Everything is accounted. Everything is properly utilized. 
and they do very smart, competent way of using it. You can never see anything. But in Nigeria, for example, you go, you can't account for 20% of the oil that we have. That is the reason why we compare these two and see the difference is just too much. I, I, I believe that at the end of the day, like what I explained, I say it's a matter of time. We, 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 we will delay this the way we are managing ourselves. We will continue to be in problems for the next 50 years. Or if we do well, in five years we will start getting ourselves out of the problems if we manage ourselves well. If you see the Asian countries, what they did, the, the South Koreans, the Singapore, Malaysia, and they, they were not better than us three decades ago. We were far better. If you also see, for example, a couple of uh, Latin American countries, we were far better. If you see Peru, if you go, almost all of them we were far, far better. But somehow they made a new turn and change. Read and see the story of what happened in South Korea. And in fact, compare South Korea and North Korea, it will tell you a story. And Malaysia and then Singapore and Lee Kuan Yew. Leaders somehow you know, woke up and then decided to do what is right and then change their societies. In Africa, unfortunately, we are yet to see that in large scale. We have pockets, small here and there, who are doing fairly well. I want to give you an example with Botswana. Botswana is doing extremely well. Botswana has been developing almost 10 digits in the last 10 to 15 years. Why? Simply because they are able to address this problem. They had good quality leadership in the 70s, and it continued. I want to give you an example with Ghana. Ghana is a country that was terrible, very, very bad, up to 70s. Then suddenly, with luck, they got what a man called Jerry Rollins. Very tough, very brutal. But some of the things he did changed the country. Ghana today is a country that organized elections, five elections. Out of it, they had change of government from opposition to, I mean, from the ruling party to the opposition. It's only Ghana and the whole of our own West African subcontinent that it happened. The economy of Ghana is developing six to seven digits. Obama is going to Ghana this week. And it shows you that when with little changes, with better quality, improved leadership, leadership with integrity, things will change. You go to Rwanda, Paul Kagame is doing an extremely good job there. It's a country that came out from a civil war. They killed themselves about 10 years ago, close to about one quarter of the population. Today, Rwanda is developing also close to 7 to 8 percent. The changes that is taking place in Rwanda is profound, it's unbelievable. Why? It's simply because of the quality of the leadership. We have also seen, for example, in Uganda, even though unfortunately some of them, over a time they started, they will start believing that they are God. I mean, they are, that the country does not exist without them. Yaweri Museveni did extremely well in the 90s, but suddenly he started believing like some of the other African leaders, that there is no Uganda without him, and he's beginning to go down. It's all about leadership. Leadership that did fairly well before suddenly has changed, and is becoming bad, and is bringing the country down, and they're developing the country, like what Mugabe did to, or is doing to uh, Zim, uh, Zimbabwe. My hope about Africa, and my belief is that, well, hopefully, leadership with integrity and accountability may start imagining. The challenge confronting Africa today is good governance. Competent, honest, hard-working people who will be in charge in the state or the different, different countries. If you just get 10 to 15 quality leaders in Africa, it is going to change the, con uh, the, the, the continent. At different times, societies do face different challenges. The challenge confronting us today is that of good governance, fighting corruption. Like how we fought and got independence 40 years ago. 20 years ago, we fought and, got and defeated apartheid. And today, there is no country in Africa that is suffering from apartheid. We have defeated it. The next fight, 
and I hope the world will understand and support us, is to fight to get good governance, fight to remove corruption in our own system. And leaders with that credentials has to emerge to take the lead. If you get four, five to ten quality leaders in Africa, I imagine if you are going to get a good quality leader in Ghana, in Nigeria, if you get in Nigeria, you are likely going to change Niger, you will change Burkina Faso, you will change Benin Republic. Chances are you will even change Cameroon. If you get a good quality leader in Kenya, it is going to trickle, but it will go around. Get a good, unfortunately, we take the reverse gear now in South Africa. Hopefully, it's not the case. But imagine that we are going to get such quality, good leaders, those who will insist. If you have good, honest, quality leaders, strong leaders in Africa, someone like Mugabe will not be there as a president by today. This is what is needed. This is what I think may be hope. Maybe this is going to be the chance for the continent to turn around and also start addressing its own problem. The outside world cannot do anything. But I also want to see the possibility that the world will understand it is about the issue of governance. It's not about you going to Africa and saying that you are going to be giving a handout for them to continue. The bonus of this world, the Bob Geldofs of this world, will understand that they will help Africa more if they will start singing about good governance in, in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> and I can, I can assure you, the moment you start getting quality, honest, good leaders, bad leaders have destroyed us. Bad leaders will have to give way for us to start getting out of these problems. You can afford to have bad leaders in Europe. It will not make any impact. <laughs> you can have 10 Balasconis in, in Europe. It will not make any impact to you. But you can see what Mugabe is doing to us. You can see what Muzuma is do, going to us. Because we have nothing. We are almost at the beginning, scratch. No bad leader can stop you from getting health system in there. No bad leader can stop you from getting education. No bad leader can help you can remove this infrastructure that you already have. In, in our continent, we don't have anything. These small resources that we have, the little money that goes in, whether it is our natural resources, or it is our human resources, or it is even donor support that goes in to the country, ends up into wrong hands, into wrong pockets, and is used negatively. Instead of using it for development, it turns out to be a curse, and it destroys us more. That is the problem. I believe that there is not a loss of completely. Let the, let, let the world wake up to the reality that the continent requires its own good leaders, and that they must do something, whatever, that to support it. Let the more Ibrahims of this world understand. Instead for you to wait until when and the uh, president has finished out of 54, you pick one and give him price for being an honest person. Can they invest and start having new, fresh leaders who will not do the damage in the first instance? And let, the world, let Obama understand that. Let the European Union understand that. And it is not going to be too difficult. Insist, insist. These small, cheap groups who are in charge of our own affairs can easily be taken care of. They are nothing. The moment you narrow the space for them, the moment you make it impossible for them to steal, or if they steal, they have no place for them to sit and enjoy, it's the beginning of the solution to the problems of Africa. Thank you very much, but um, I may slightly differ in the sense that well, 70% of the problems of poverty are poor governance is due to bad leadership. How, did, how does the country allow the bad leaders to survive? Let us go into that to some extent. Is it because that they have vested interest in poverty that they don't want poverty to be eradicated? My friend Mr. Vijayanta was mentioning about 85%. I, I don't agree with that figure. It is not 85% poverty below uh, poverty level, which somewhere around 60% perhaps. But even so, poverty exists, there's no doubt about that. And we have had good, bad and indifferent leaders. In spite of that, we are not able to make a big, big uh, dent in the economic growth of the country. Although industrially we have gone forward, technologically we have gone forward, Still slums exist in India, still 
in remote villages, uh, particularly North India, in UP, Bihar, and Rajasthan, we have illiteracy, ignorance, and malnutrition. But we have pockets of excellence, but that does not satisfy us. What is the use of having a few regions uh, very well, very, uh, very economically forward, very intellectually advanced, but we have pockets of poverty, disillusionment. So the question is, is there a glimmer of hope? I have no doubt there is a glimmer of hope. Things are changing, but it is changing at a slow pace. Who is going to expedite the pace? It is not, the leaders have, but how do you bring about good leaders? Who is to take responsibility? Voters have to show their skill and will. Mr. Siddharth was mentioning about Mumbai. We had very bad terrorist attack. Immediately after that, all people, all religion, they all came together and said, we will teach a lesson to the politicians. How they did not tackle this problem properly so far. But did they? Only 45% of the people came to vote in Bombay. Whereas the national average was 59%. Bombay, which is supposed to have most enlightened uh, citizenship, people didn't come. One of the main reasons, of course, they gave is that election was held on a day which was close to the weekend of three days. For four days, people went away. They did not come and exercise the vote. <laughs> With this attitude, do you think you can eradicate poverty, you can check poor leaders. People have to teach a lesson. And I do not think we can always attribute it to poor leadership. If necessary, we have to throw this poor uh, the, uh, <coughs> leadership which is responsible for this vested interest in poverty. We have to teach a lesson. The youth have an answer to this. It is not, I think the, the present generation have failed. There is no doubt about it, particularly in Asia and Africa. Whether it is Burma, whether it is Pakistan, whether it is India, any country, Colombia. Some of vested interest in poverty has allowed these leaders to continue to exist, flourish and thrive. We have to throw them out, democratically, not violently. And that lies ultimately through the power of the ballot. I have a small statement in my book which I thought I will read. This is at the end of my book, which may have some relevance. Democracy is more than a ballot paper, a polling station, a political party or a politician. Democratic product or dividend is an important, is as important as democratic process. Their proper linkage is the key to democratic success. The average politician or civil servant in most present day democracies does not enjoy the confidence or the trust of the people. But we can make the players in the democratic drama realize the importance of value based leadership, public sensitivity, and accountability through concerted public action. A most unfortunate trend in India in recent years has been steady and common dissolution among the people's representatives in legislatures. Democracy is an endless journey. It has no time limits or borders. It has to be kept in fine fettle by every generation, for it has a tendency to derail when people are not vigilant. In fact, there is an author who says democracy has got both destructive and constructive inherent features. It is what you make of democracy. Don't blame democracy. Blame the people who operate the democracy. I, for one, have no doubt at all that every generation owes it to the next to pass on the vibrant political tradition for all times to come. The answer lies for all this. To have a glimmer of hope is to assert, people should assert their rights. They cannot be mute witnesses. And I have no doubt, things are changing everywhere. What is, what is necessary is to give a big push and that lies in the hands of young people like you. Thank you.